Thank you very much. I'm really uh, looking forward to the rest of this morning's session. And we're going to start it off with uh, Lori Knowles. Uh, and we're starting now to address the policy side of uh, on this side of the Atlantic. And to discuss the United States, Ms. Lori Knowles uh, is going to speak to us uh, on, uh, on our, our policies and related sets of issues. Ms. Knowles is, the bioethics policy cons is a bioethics policy consultant and research associate of the Health Law Institute at the University of Alberta, Canada, where she specializes in international com comparative law, particularly as it relates to biotechnology regulation. She has acted as consultant to President George W. Bush's Council on Bioethics, President Clinton's National Bioethics Advisory Committee, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, Genome Canada, and the Canadian Biotechnology Advisory Committee, and the National Academy of Sciences uh, bodies, among others. She holds law degrees from institutions in Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States. And this morning, uh, Ms. Knowles will review current U.S. stem cell research policies on the state and national level. Welcome, Ms. Knowles. Good morning. Well, I should say that um, I actually live in Boston, so um, I'm somewhat more qualified than it might sound like uh, to be giving the current U.S. stem cell policy. I do have a virtual appointment to the University of Alberta um, in this newfangled age of technology. So um, I'm actually going to talk about setting standards across the states. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the current status of the federal stem cell policy. Um, and then look very briefly at some state initiatives. Um, you have a lot of detail in the handout that we were given today, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to spend a lot of time on those, but that looks like a very good um, overview. And uh, I'm going to sketch some regulatory options uh, looking at international, diverse international approaches and state examples, and outline some central questions that need to be answered by those setting up a stem cell initiative, state stem cell initiative, and lay out some major areas for standard setting um, by pointing to some international norms to, norms to guide the exercise of standard setting. So ambitiously, I have 24 slides to get through with you today, so we'll see what happens in, in our time. Um, current federal policy, all I want to add to what you've already heard is that um, the uh, availability funding is quite limited. The number of available cell lines is much less than the 60 that was um, talked about in uh, August of 2001, it's closer to 20. Um, those, all of those lines that are available for funding are lines that were cultured in mouse feeder cells, so they would not be um, good sources for clinical therapies. And funding to date is about $25 million um, dollars per year on embryonic stem cell research, which is a very, very small amount. Um, in May of last year, the House passed the Stem Cell Research Enhancement Act, which was uh, geared at expanding federal funding and was going to use as the source of cells, we've heard about different source of cells, only surplus, surplus IVF embryos. So um, sort of circumventing the issue of research cloning, which is also called therapeutic cloning, same thing. Um, there is a Senate bill that is, uh, that, by, by the way, I should say the House bill passed um, 238 or so to 194, those are the numbers I remember, um, more or less, so not enough to override a veto. Um, and the Senate bill um, <coughs> being sponsored by um, Arlen Specter, a Republican from um, Pennsylvania, um, is probably going to be voted on in spring of 2006. There's a ramping up right now of a lot of talk about the bill, um, trying to collect votes. They believe they may have a veto-proof uh, majority for this bill. That's really uncertain. The outcome is unknown. Uh, a lot of people are holding their cards really close to their chests. And um, um, President um, Bush has said that he will veto any such bill if he can. So um, the results then of this as background have implications for the science, which you are aware of, um, traveling overseas, and also for what I'm calling biobusiness. Um, and we're going to look at that now. I am going to focus on um, human embryonic stem cells 
precisely because they're the most controversial source. So the information that you're going to see may apply to adult stem cells as well, but my focus is human embryonic stem cells. So international policy responses, we've heard a lot about the UK, and I'm not going to go over that, other than um, there's a breadth of responses from the very permissive to the very restrictive, and the, I'm using the UK as very permissive. And as was mentioned, the secondary stem cell uses right now are only subject to oversight by the National Stem Cell Bank Steering Committee. The same is true actually in Canada. In Canada, there's an, an overarching act, which like the HFE Act, that looks at uh, or will look at when they constitute their agency uses of embryos, but not secondary stem cell use. And so right now that's covered um, by the um, Canadian Institutes of Health Research Guidelines, very similar to this set up. Other countries are very permissive, Singapore, South Korea, China, Israel, Sweden, Belgium, not, not that list is not exhaustive, but there is a Far Eastern concentration of expertise um, using uh, cloning, cloned embryos as well as a source. And then a whole cluster, and I would agree with Mark, it's the predominant cluster of permissive, permissive countries that use surplus IVF embryos. So we're sort of going from most permissive down to most restrictive, and those include countries like Canada, France, Australia, um, and I'll show you a map in just a second. Germany, my understanding is that they have, I do know that they have obviously strict research embryo laws. My understanding is that the importation of stem cells is still permitted, um, and that uh, became law in about 2002. And it is ironic, at the time it, it actually was passed, um, I noted that the French were actually doing the same thing at that time. They have since changed their law. But it is interesting that it would be all right to bring in stem cells derived elsewhere under other standards um, that are not standards that you yourself endorse and do that research um, in your own country. That's a little bit ironic, I think. So um, this is a, a very good resource that um, Bill Hoffman from Minnesota <laughs> continually updates. And I would um, recommend it to you if you're interested in sort of seeing what's happening in the world. He's been working on this now for several years. And I called him, asked him for his most recent version of it before I came here, and this is it. Um, brown indicates permissive, dark brown indicates um, uh, research cloned embryos as a source are available for research, light brown is surplus. So that's kind of an interesting slide, shows you there's a great deal of stem cell research happening um, in a number of places, shows you that U.S. is in the company of much of Africa um, and um, Pakistan and other places in the world in being restrictive. And um, I will now move on to state policy options. So all I want you to take home from this uh, state policy option part of the presentation is don't try and absorb the information that's already in your booklet on who does what, that's crazy because it's constantly changing. In fact, I was checking on stuff last night in the hotel room just to make sure that nothing new had happened. And in the last week, new things have happened. Maryland's now on the list, and it wasn't on the list as of, I think it came on the list Friday, as having passed in their house um, an embryo research, uh, research uh, stem cell friendly bill. So this is the take home message from this. There were 60 bills introduced in 2004, 180 bills introduced in 2005 or so. And it looks like there's 30 to 50 bills been introduced in the first two months of um, uh, this year. So the activity is incredible. Um, is the is the bottom line to try and jump in, follow California, New Jersey, and make something happen in the United States. And it's very clear that it's not just about new therapies, um, bringing new therapies to people in your home state, but it's clearly about business as well. It's about business development. It's about job creation, and that is very clearly illustrated by the salvos between Missouri and Illinois governors. Um, one writing letter to to the funders in, in Missouri and scientists saying, you know, look, they're not friendly to you there. We are, come, just come across, you know, to us. Um, and that's been quite successful because Missouri now has this really sort of large um, impetus behind, behind a constitutional amendment to protect scientists' rights to do this research and to protect citizens' rights to have access to this, a constitutional amendment, very interesting. So um, here are some of the uh, diverse, complex, contradictory, and shifting options open to states. You could prohibit all embryo research. 
you could prohibit research derivation using live embryos. So anything, any state that says you can't do research, uh, non-therapeutic research on embryos, prohibits embryo research because if it's non-therapeutic, it's not. It's it's research. If it's therapy, it's therapy. So um, there are uh, prohibitions uh, uh, prohibiting research on cloned embryos. Um, the ones that have question marks are they're going in that direction. Perhaps things have just recently changed. There's some ambiguity in the law. Um, you can prohibit public funding for stem cell research or for all cloning. Um, you can uh, encourage stem cell research. You can uh, provide public funding for stem cell research. And we're anticipating something happening in Wisconsin and Massachusetts, as well as other places. You can permit cloning of embryos for um, stem cell research. There are a few places that do that. And you can support it, but prohibit research cloning. And these are where the bills are pending as of the research I could get last night. So um, you can see that it's a shifting uh, uh, area of regulation. So now what I want to talk about is something a little more, less descriptive, more substantive, which is a regulatory option. So if you were a state and you were starting from scratch and you wanted to look at what you might do, how you might set standards, what you might put in place, what structures, what are things to look at. So California, obviously, we're going to hear from Arlene about California um, firsthand, but they've set up a mini, what I call a mini NIH model, um, using public money, and there's a, a word missing here, it should say decentralized research endeavor. So they have a, although they have a centralized funding body, they do have research at a number of different centers, and that's what I mean by that last um, description. Um, New Jersey, also using public money, obviously less public money, more centralized research endeavor. Their funding has been aimed at setting up institutes, usually, namely two, um, at this point. And whether they will have some kind of centralized oversight beyond institutional review is not yet clear. They're working on that. So a central question then is, who funds this research? Is it public money? Is it private money? Because if it's private money, likely um, it will respond to restrictions that follow that money. If it's public money, um, that makes it much, much more complicated. Um, and so that is, I would say, the central question to start with. And who decides the merits of the research? Is there some overarching body? Is it just the local review? We'll look at some different policy options for that. Um, and who decides what standards should apply? Again, oversight, na national, there isn't at this point, there are guidelines, we'll talk about those um, from the National Academy of Sciences, but what, what standards should actually apply such that we can facilitate international collaboration? Um, the National Academy of Sciences in May of 2005, I think it was May, it could be April, 2005, published a guidelines on stem cell research, and they essentially jumped into the void to try and provide some kind of, not just a regulatory structure, but, but uh, some ethical guidance on how to um, craft these kind of standards um, and how you might actually implement these standards at a state level. Very useful, has been quite persuasive in California, um, although they have gone beyond those standards, which I think is a, a very good thing to not sort of assume that that is simply the, the uh, baseline, but they have gone beyond those, made those stricter, and provides a template for international, uh, inter interstate and international harmonization, I think, um, which will be useful in a state-driven stem cell endeavor. Um, also has been a huge procedural logjam for California. And that's not surprising because if you look at the international experience with developing standards and putting into place agencies, um, both the UK and Canada, UK took a decade and Canada took two decades to get that in place. And so when you look at what's been done in California in 15 months, that's lightning speed when you're talking about putting into place regulations and putting into place people. They had to hire the people to look at what options would be in place, what standards should be in place. Really is going extremely fast, and I would say very thoughtfully, and I don't work for them, so that's my opinion. Um, and, uh, and really um, continues to move quite fast, I would say. Okay, so here's some regulatory options. 
The first is to use what I'm calling existing infrastructure, federal regulations that currently apply to stem cell uh, research, institutional committees and professional guidelines, and to use that ex existing infrastructure to guide the oversight of stem cell research. And at this point, I usually get asked, what, you know, what are the federal regulations that apply? Well, I'm not going to go through them, but I am going to show you that there are, in fact, a number of existing federal regulations that do apply because this is human subjects research in a number of cases, um, particularly when you're using identifiable information that goes with the stem cell uh, line or the, the donated tissue from which it's derived. Um, and what that means is that there is likely going to be institutional review board, IRB, protocol review for human subjects research, especially if the, the research is funded or the institution takes federal funding, um, and also animal uh, institutional animal care and use committees, part of that as well, useful for chimeric research or preclinical trial research involving animals. I should have added to this um, institutional biosafety committees as well. So there are a number of things already in place that make part of that infrastructure um, that are regulated at the federal level. Um, including FDA regulations on cell biologics, the RAC if there's recombinant DNA involved. Um, that's a typo that's supposed to have two A's, not two P's. I must have been having my midnight snack when I, when I put, wrote that. Um, uh, HIPAA laws, uh, privacy laws, um, Portability Accountability Act of in Health Information. Um, animal Welfare Acts if you're using animals as well. So just to, to name a few. Um, now option two, is the uh, use of existing infrastructure but mandating that it apply to all stem cell research. So not just that research that is federally funded, and if you're talking about research that's anonymous then would be exempt from the federal regulations, you're saying that doesn't matter, we use the infrastructure that we have in place, the IRBs, and um, we're going to mandate that that applies to all uh, stem cell research. Now that was what was ori originally written into the New Jersey law um, when it was passed, and that may or may not change in New Jersey, depending on what they do with the NAS um, guidelines. Uh, option three, and we'll, we'll discuss some of the pros and cons of these in a minute, is to mandate a new stem cell oversight committee to operate at all institutions conducting stem cell research. This was the NAS recommendation, um, and they call them embryos, embryonic stem cell research oversight committees. Um, and uh, something like that um, has been adopted in California as well. Uh, so you've got a new committee, um, which is both good and bad. It certainly adds um, another committee, but it does have its own expertise, and we'll talk about that in a minute too. Uh, option four, as I'm calling it, and these are just my uh, ideas of what the options might be, and there's certainly more, I'm sure, uh, is to create a statewide oversight committee to oversee all state stem cell research. And then the answer is, would it be governmental? Would it be non-governmental, insulated from politics, not insulated from politics? Um, it, nothing is truly insulated from politics, but um, the degree to which it might be taken outside of the political process. Um, and um, this might be more useful for states, smaller states, Limited funding, centralized research certainly is an option and has some advantages as well. Most likely the option that is going to be taken up is combinations of these approaches, right? Are you going to use uh, an IRB to look at all stem cell research and then overlay it with an oversight body at the state level? Um, or are you going to combine option two, that's the IRB looking at all of them, with option three, the embryo states stem cell specific board that's closer to the um, NAS guideline approach? And then the issue is, what about a national oversight layer? Uh, the NIH normally would provide that. Um, and in the absence of the NIH providing that, we have the National Academy of Sciences uh, establishing a national oversight body. And they are not going to be a regulatory body. That's happening now. It was in their guidelines, and they're actually establishing it now. Um, but they are going to, this national body, review the guidelines, review the guidelines that they themselves are putting forward as a template, and uh, provide a forum for continued discussion on these issues. I think that's quite useful, actually. It's difficult to see right now how that will interact with the states um, if the states all adopt the template, then yes, it will be easier. If they don't, it'll be a little bit more difficult. Okay, so let's look at the content of these options. The first is uh, with regard to 
using the existing infrastructure, the IRBs, the Institutional uh, Review Boards, can existing institutional committees, IRBs, the Animal Use and Care Committees, uh, function as stem cell oversight bodies? Can they do that? Well, they do have experience that can be used in prior protocol review. Um, the question is really, is additional oversight needed on top of that? And to answer that question, you really have to know what IRBs do, and most of you do, but I'll just uh, run through some of the benefits that they have. They have substantial expertise in some specific areas that would be useful for stem cell oversight, particularly dealing with, of course, uh, human subjects research. They are familiar with the risk-benefit assessment of the research. They are familiar with issues relating to uh, consent, getting consent from donors of tissue, and they usually are very uh, integral in managing that process, making sure that that process is well-driven. And um, they also are familiar with conflicts of interest management, which we know are part, is part of the background with stem cell research as well. One of the things that IRBs do very nicely in many cases is they can respond to local sensitivities of a community since they serve a particular institution in a particular community. They often are more responsive than, say, a higher up level of, of a regulatory response to the sensitivities of the community that they serve. So that is a possible benefit from IRBs. There is no significant delay in using those structures because they're there and they're in place. And that, with given the timeline of stem cell research and the, the public drive to have this move forward now, is a significant benefit. They are already operational, already constituted. There is the phenomena of institutional capture. So what that means is sometimes it's very hard for an IRB to um, stand up uh, against a star researcher. So, who has a lot of funding, brings in a lot of funding to an institution. So the phenomenon of institutional capture mitigates against some of the other positives. Isn't always present, but is definitely something to be uh, concerned about. And this is a really significant one. Members of IRBs will tell you that they already have too much work. There's way too much work already on them. It's a significant burden to do this thoughtfully and in a timely manner. This would add to that, of course, as well. Do they have significant or sufficient sorry, uh, expertise? Um, that's an open question. It really depends on whether you're talking about chimeric research or not chimeric research. Do they do a lot of embryo research at the institution already? Is this a new enterprise? You can, of course, as an IRB, bring in expert consultants from the outside. That's certainly possible. This is another one. Variation in standards between IRBs. Some IRBs are excellent, top-notch, and some are not. Um, a greater the number of institutional bodies, when you have multiple IRBs looking at protocols across the state, uh, you have what's considered a lack of transparency. The higher the degree of centralization, the easier it is to get the information out to the public to maintain public confidence. You can see what's being done uh, on a website or following through a, a state oversight body of some sort. Much harder to do when it's all located down at the institutional level. And there are inefficiencies, of course, as well, to having multiple IRBs dealing with these things that mitigates against the fact that they are already in place. Uh, okay, one of the nice things about having institutional stem cell oversight bodies, institutional stem cell oversight bodies, is that they create an expertise at an institution in this particular topic, and they spread the expertise as well. Um, and they have uh, also provide faster protocol review if it's done by many boards against, um, but there are mitigating against that differences in standards and application that are possible as well. So um, there are, and, and I would say third, there are inefficiencies in setup. These now have to be created. This new board right has to be created, has to be peopled. We have to set up standards for it as well. Um, the statewide oversight, there are efficiencies in setup. It's one board one form, one set of forms, one set of central repository for information. So there's some efficiency in setting up one oversight system. Definitely a slower start mm -hmm. time or delay in setting up a higher level um, oversight body. Um, I would say one of the, the big pluses to having um, a more centralized oversight mechanism is 
uh, with this third one, ease of collaborations, harmonization of standards, forms, etc. And that is particularly important where we're talking about doing international multi-center trials, international research. So where you have the ability to harmonize your standards, make it very clear that everybody is following a particular standard, the forms look the same, the, the hoops you jump through are the same, it certainly makes reciprocity of standards and harmonization easier. Um, provides greater transparency, I mentioned that as well, and can be combined with other options on an institutional level to capture expertise and infrastructure that's already in place. Okay, so um, here are the questions then you'd have to answer for that kind of a body, a higher level oversight body. What will the nature of the oversight body be, governmental or non-governmental, we already talked about that. Um, what will the composition be? Well, it's clear that in Canada and the UK, they have to be the oversight bodies that are national but are analogous um, have to be multidisciplinary. And in fact, in the UK, there has to be a preponderance of non clinicians on the board. That's very interesting. It's very different from the setup of the California board, which tends to be much more clinicians than. Uh, and researchers than lay people. So there are different ways um, to look at the composition. Generally, there has to be, it has to be multidisciplinary to catch all the different facets that you can of the issues that are going to come before them. What powers will it have? Will it centralize information management? That certainly would be a very positive function. Record keeping, tracking of all the cell lines, also very difficult to do that. Will it centralize monitoring and compliance? Because obviously there have to be, to have the standards in place is one part of the picture, but if you can't actually monitor that those standards are being followed and ensure compliance, they're not useful to you. And how are you going to do that? And then people forget this issue too. What additional infrastructure will be needed for the oversight body to function efficiently? So are there information systems, computer systems, um, that are going to be needed to in place to bring together the information registry function that will necessarily have to be part of this endeavor on a state level. Okay, this is a little less dry. Um, setting standards. Um, this is this is how you embed ethics into oversight. And we heard already from Baruch Brody this morning some sort of larger ethical uh, issues in terms of policy. This is how you make it sort of operational. And I would say that anywhere where you have embryos and reproductive tissue and donation of reproductive tissue, ethics have to be part of what I call the fabric of oversight. They can't be layered on somewhere else. So, and then in, you know, often in, in research, there'll be this review and then there'll be an ethics review. They actually have to be part of the fabric of the oversight um, in this process. And I think it's important to describe the ceiling of behavior, not just the floor of behavior. So when you have laws with criminal sanctions or, or civil sanctions, fines, those describe what I call the floor of behavior. But the ceiling of behavior is actually really important to articulate as well. So ceiling of behavior you can articulate in practice guidelines, and there are some of those in the UK, codes of conduct. There's a lot of room for professional self-regulation when you're talking about describing the ceiling. I think that's extremely important. And I would say, I would emphasize again the importance of harmonization that's so that there can be international collaboration, so that there can be facilitation of those and reciprocity of recognition of standards across states and across nations. And there are really three areas for standard setting. How am I doing for time? Um, there is the procurement of the donated material, human tissue. There is, uh, and by that I mean generally ga gametes, uh, but not always. Derivation of stem cells is a second area. There's been a lot of discussion of that already. And then use and storage of the cell lines. That's what's called the secondary uses of the human stem cell lines, but not just the derivation. And, and anybody who wants this, I should have told you this at the beginning so you didn't have to take notes, um, I'll send you the presentation. Uh, procurement. So. We're talking about standards that relate to procurement, and I'm going to outline for you, Just you're going to see just how difficult it is to put these procedures in place, because when you see the number of uh, sort of enumerated things, I clearly have missed some that need to be addressed through policy. You'll recognize just how difficult this is and how fast we're going. Um, donor screening where appropriate. Um, there is, in fact, uh, a change to the UK egg donation policy that came in um, last week or the week before. 
which said that they're not going to just use surplus IVF embryos, that they're actually going to allow donation um, for medical purposes. So women who are not undergoing uh, medical treatments or infertility treatments will be permitted to, um, this is I think open for public consultation yet, but will be permitted to donate their ova for medical purposes. That's a huge change in the background of egg donation because what it does is it allows women to make a decision to undergo a potentially harmful procedure with potentially negative consequences for altruistic reasons not related to fertility but related to research. Big change. Um, and they anticipated that this was going to be extremely controversial. The HFEA said, we, we anticipate that this will be controversial, but what it does show is that there is a driver to get more ova available for the research where ova can be used in creating embryos. Interesting. Certainly something we anticipated would happen. Um, informed consent. Um, is it going to be written specific <coughs> consent, specific to HES cell research, embryo um, stem cell research? Yes, generally. What about future research uses? You're generally supposed to give consent to the research uses that you, um, all research uses, know their risks and, and their benefits. But we don't know what's coming with human embryonic stem cell research. So in California, they have said, um, in their guidelines, very recent guidelines, we will, you can put restrictions, not restrictions, you can show us your preferences as a donor of OVA for an embryos for what you would like to have done with them, but we will only use those that consent to all future uses of research, um, which is outside the common rule, the, the sense of, of what it means to give informed consent, probably necessary. Um, compensation, sorry, I'm ahead of myself. Compensation. Um, in the UK, that's actually changing. There's uh, currently you can get about 15 pounds reimbursed um, in the UK for um, donation of, of uh, your eggs, and there's a, a live discussion about whether that will be changed to 250 pounds. So that's a big difference. 250 pounds is like a $480, like about right, something like that. So it's a big difference from 15 pounds to 250 pounds and would sort of change, and Mark is absolutely right, that the background of the non-commercialization for tissue in the UK is a really strong background, not the same as we have it here where we have payments for blood um, and eggs. Um, so that is a big change. California allows um, reasonable medical expenses to be reimbursed and... Um, they do something really interesting and groundbreaking, and that is they have recently passed rules that say that an institution is going to be responsible for the unpaid medical expenses of women who donate eggs and develop medical complications. That's new. That's brand new in this area, and that's really, um, I think, a very good development. Confidentiality, what are you going to do about the information as it tracks through from the donors? We really do need to know the information that goes with the donors in a lot of cases. And how are you going to manage that information and how are you going to manage conflicts of interest? Uh, will gametes and embryos from anonymous donors who did not th give their consent that are previously banked, will they be used? Under what circumstances will a donor be able to withdraw consent? I mean, once your embryos or your ova have been used to create a stem cell line, can you then withdraw consent? Not really. It's already sort of in the pipeline in California, certainly, in their guidelines. Uh, it shows that in the conformed consent procedure, you have to understand that at a certain point you won't be able to withdraw because your material will be out there and being used. That is also different from the background of human subjects research where you can withdraw at any point. How will they be identified, the samples, in terms of information, and what systems will they be in place? How will they be managed? So procurement. Um, the first thing is what procedures are going to be put in place to obtain informed consent. We know, obviously, I just mentioned the increased demand for ova and embryos is, is certain. Um, we have in place already some conflict of interest management strategies. We have fetal tissue transplantation guidelines, federal guidelines that put a separation between the researcher clinician, um, and the researcher and the clinician. No, I've got the yes, clinician and the researcher. Um, and they also separate fertility services from decisions to donate. And this is with respect to fetal tissue for transplantation purposes. There's, um, but this is definitely something that has been imported into this realm with respect to trying to manage conflicts of interest. 
and there's no directed donation as well. You can't say my tissue will, I'll donate my tissue for my, uh, for the use of this disease um, if it only goes to these types of people. It's directed donation. Documentation issues uh, and compliance issues. Okay, which embryos? Surplus are created for research. That's the big question. Um, and as I mentioned, there's kind of an international line. This is sort of international norms come into place in, this, in these issues. And one of the, the areas in which there was sort of pure consensus was that surplus embryos made the, less, the least problematic source for embryo research, leftover IVF embryos. That's definitely shifting as more and more countries move into wanting to use cloning technology. Time limits, international norm is 14 days, the UK and many other countries in the world. That is the international norm for when you must stop uh, work research on an embryo. Prior protocol review is also an international norm. Are the human embryos oocytes necessary? Are there animal, is there animal model work that can be done instead? Um, are the numbers necessary? Those are built into most prior protocol review. Um, can you use fewer, for example? Um, and under what circumstances will creation be deemed warranted? Record keeping again. Um, conscientious objection is interesting, something that's been coming up a lot with respect to pharmacies um, and uh, disbursement of, um, of morning after pills and things like that in this country. Um, will there be policies addressing conscientious objection, um, as there are in the UK? The NAS, National Academy of Sciences, also has a provision for conscientious objection. <coughs> Could certainly complicate things too. Um, secondary use of stem cells, creating chimeras. I think, in the interest of, of time, I will um, really quickly wrap this up. But um, creating chimeras has generally been an area of international agreement. There are certain things that can't be done with chimeric embryos. It is, however, a very important piece of the stem cell research puzzle needing to use chimeric embryos for preclinical applications, preclinical trials. Um, and there are certain things that should be avoided when you're creating chimeras as well. Banking and distribution issues. I just want to make an, a note on here um, about creation of, of intellectual property. That's what IP is. And that is, um, IP is one of the areas where there's been um, significant uh, concern in California about what they were going to do with publicly funded research were, were, were people going to have to pay twice, which is often the model that's used um, where we fund through our tax dollars basic research, then it goes into the private pipeline and we pay again for the medication or whatever it is, the therapy on the other end. So there's been a lot of concern about creation of, of intellectual property partnerships between academia and industry. Were they going to, to follow the Baidol model or were they going to emphasize a more public ownership model? Well, um, California, again, has done something really interesting last week or the week before, um, and they have said that after the first half million dollars of income comes in, um, from then there'll be a 25% of, of the income will go back to the state to serve the people in the state. Sorry, okay, I'll finish up. Um, and there'll be no exclusive licenses as well, which is really interesting and different. And then my last, my last thoughts are... Um, it's a complicated and multifaceted task, has to be undertaken thoughtfully and with care. It might be interesting to look at an incremental approach from a state perspective, laboratory policy standards first, then clinical, that's likely how it's going to happen. Um, embryonic and then adult, since generally what will apply to embryonic might apply to adult as well, and that it's an, in an international endeavor, and so we need to be aware of what's happening internationally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lori. Uh, I, think we're, I think we're doing well on time, but since we're going to ask Lori to join the panel here in a minute, maybe we'll hold the questions for everybody together. So we, we are very pleased to have uh, uh, several panelists who are going to speak to us on different issues. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Arlene Chu. Arlene is director of the Scientific Program and Review Activities at the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. Previously, Dr. Chu was the Associate Director of the Office of Research Administration of the National Institutes of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering at the National Institutes of Health. And before that, she was the Program Director of Stem Cell Research 
and for research on spinal cord injury uh, at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Dr. Chu also has served on the NIH Stem Cell Task Force and the NIH Stem Cell Implementation Committee, organized uh, national and international workshops on stem cell research, and has led efforts to promote cooperation with the U.S. Food uh, and Drug Administration in expediting the use of stem cells and therapies. Dr. Chu graduated from Stanford University, received her PhD from California Institute of Technology, and did her postdoctoral training at Washington University at St. Louis. And uh, we find we're also related, uh, at least through my research director. So you know, it's not direct, but, uh, but in science, that's about as close a relation as you can be. She'll be giving us a perspective on the California Initiative. And so please welcome uh, Dr. Arlene Chu. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be here at the James A. Baker the Third Institute for Public Policy on the campus of Rice University. And I really want to thank the organizers, both the Institute and the British Consulate, for providing me an opportunity to be here, uh, and particularly to Dr. Lane for this important workshop. Uh, as you know, I work for the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, which is a new state agency brought into existence by the voters of the state of California when they passed Proposition 71 a little bit around 15 months ago. And simply put, the goal of this new state agency is to fund stem cell research that will lead to therapies and cures. Oftentimes I get the question, so why is the state of California so interested in supporting stem cell research, and why is that important to the United States? And I don't think this audience needs that, but suffice it to say, stem cell research, as you all know, is an international worldwide effort. And I've just summarized here a partial list across four continents where the governments have, of these countries have decided to put state money into funding stem cell research. So that gives you an idea of the endeavor. So in the United States, obviously the NIH is the biggest supporter of biomedical research with an annual budget of around $28 billion. So therefore, since there is no federal legislation regarding and regulation regarding stem cell research, we turn to funding to regulate what activities are allowed. And I will touch upon the uh, federal support and policy, and what this policy means for, for researchers uh, using NIH funding, and then turn to non-federal support before I tell you about what CIRM hopes to do. So this is just to remind me that there are many sources of stem cells, and the NIH supports all sources of stem cells, but with some provisions. Um, the key points, and you already know this, is that there is a date, August 9, 2001, and any line uh, derived before that uh, under certain conditions is allowed uh, to receive federal funding. Uh, and the most important point being currently on the registry, there are 22 lines available for U.S. researchers. These are the actual numbers I got off the NIH website just last week, and they've been uh, the date that they were revised was Feb 3rd. So the United States, or at least the NIH, funded $607 million in stem cell research in 2005. Of that, $39 million, which is the highest they've ever spent thus far, was directed at human embryonic stem cell research. The bulk of the money is spent on adult stem cells, the other lines on uh, the previous slide. So what does this mean for researchers receiving NIH funding? First of all, all the approved lines, as you've already heard, have been exposed to animal products, be it fetal layers or fetal calf serum or some other product. And although it doesn't mean that the FDA will not allow these lines to be used in human clinical therapies, they are designated as xenotransplantation and therefore have to undergo further um, uh, uh, barriers in terms of regulations. Can't derive new lines no matter what the method is. Also, personnel, equipment, or supplies paid for by federal funds cannot be used for research that are prohibited by the policy. And finally, um, 
the space that is used for research outside of the guidelines cannot be supported by indirect costs on federal grants. What this means is, and I've heard certain labs, you have two sets of labs and two sets of equipment with a guideline down the middle, a literally uh, sort of like a road sign, that what you do that's funded by private funding has to be done with identical equipment, non-funded by the NIH on one side. And on the other side, you can only conduct NIH you know, t uh, allowed research. So what does this mean for researchers in the United States? First, access to cell lines. The 22 lines are all that you're allowed to use, which means that it's almost uh, established as a monopoly. Even if you have learned the technique of generating new lines, you must only use the 22 allowed lines, which gives them, I won't say a stranglehold, but certainly a hold on <laughs> stem cell researchers in the country. Uh, the types and qualities of the cell lines. As I mentioned, these have been exposed to animal products. But new lines have come on board that have been generated independent of uh, any feeder lines and of any animal additives. These are not available for federally funded researchers. Uh, administrative issues, I've already pointed to the separation of uh, NIH-funded equipment versus not, NIH-funded space personnel resources versus not. If you want to do them in your institute, you must keep extremely careful accounting in case of an NIH audit. Um, acquisition of skills and experience. Nobody is going to teach you how to derive new lines because that would be, a, be against the uh, federal policy. And finally, you've heard already the myriad of state regulations. So if you're a human embryonic stem cell researcher, you have to be very cognizant of the rules of the state, which may change, as well as the rules of the federal government. What this means is a lot of young investigators find it a very high bar to think about joining the field. Why do we need new lines for genetic diversity, immunological diversity, new lines not exposed to animal products, disease-specific lines such as those that Dr. Minga has produced and hopefully will be produced by somatic cell nuclear transfer uh, for diseases for which we do not even know what the mutation is. Those will not be available for us to investigate and look for new drugs, new therapies to treat those diseases, not necessarily just for cell replacement therapy. And finally, patient-specific lines. This is a recent map that I took off the internet, which shows new lines that have been derived, that have been pub uh, mentioned or at least presented in public uh, discussions, uh, generated post-August 9, 2001. Um, that means all of these lines and possibly more, you notice that India and China are not represented here, these lines will not be available for researchers in the United States funded by NIH. And this, this number is growing. So there are sources of non-federal support that will allow researchers to do this research. And there are private foundations like the Howard Hughes Foundation that funded Doug Melton's 22 lines. There are patient advocacy groups, most specifically JDRF and the Michael J. Fox Foundation, who have also supported some work. These would be much more uh, disease-specific. And then there's slate, state funding. And um, what I wanted to show in the next slide is that several states, as you know, have stepped up to the plate. That is, Ohio in 2003 have set aside some funds for uh, stem cell research. New Jersey have twice now upped the ante. California, I'm coming to that. Connecticut, Illinois, and possibly two other states. So states are stepping in to fill the gap that's uh, pre presented because of the NIH policies. California Initiative, state specifically, to fund specifically focused on pluripotent stem cell and progenitor cell research that cannot or are unlikely to receive timely or sufficient federal funding unencumbered by limitations that would impede the research. Very simply put, it doesn't state human embryonic, it doesn't state adult. It just wants to move the science forward toward therapies and cures. And based on this, 59% of the voters in California in November of 2004 voted to authorize up to $295 million a year for 10 years to fund stem cell research in California research institutions. 
This would be through selling of state bonds, which we've been prohibited from doing right now because of the lawsuits. But that was the intent. And more importantly, up to 10% of this money could be spent on facilities to create safe havens or NIH-free space so that researchers can now do the work, not worrying, not having to worry about the impending audits from NIH. Uh, of course, it tries to assure that the research is done safely and ethically, and we have uh, several working groups to come up with policies for that, and then it prohibits the use of funds for reproductive cloning. So what this means is the act, uh, now it's an act since it's passed, uh, establishes a new agency, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, to implement this mandate of the people and it is being overseen by a board, a really large board of 29 members called the Independent Citizens Oversight Committee, uh, which is chaired by Robert Klein, who is the man who wrote Proposition 71. And the vice chair is Dr. Ed Penhold, uh, pretty remarkable, uh, because he's, all, he's on his day job, he's the president of the Moore Foundation. He also was one of the founders of Chiron, and he was the dean of uh, public uh, health uh, department at Berkeley. So he brings a very wide a range of expertise to this position. Uh, CRM's president is Dr. Zach Hall, my boss, who was um, head of physiology at UCSF, then went to NIH and was the director of the National Institute for Neuro Neurological Disorders and Stroke, rather long name, NINDS, and then returned to California where he served in important positions, administrative positions at UCSF and at USC. So he really knows the state up and down. He has strong scientific and administrative skills. Um, and the Institute eventually is authorized to have a staff of 50 to monitor and carry out many of the uh, activities that Ms. Knowles mentioned earlier, which I'm very glad she pointed out because it's a very large range of activities. And in the 15 months, we're starting to set up to do these activities. We've formed, well, the proposition establishes three working groups to help the ICOC, the board, make its decisions. These are the Standards and Ethics Working Group that decides on the standards, the ethical, medical and scientific ethical standards under which we operate. The Grants Review Working Group, which will review grants and establish our grants administration policy. And the Facilities Working Group, which will help us with big uh, bricks and mortar type of decisions regarding facilities. So what have we done in 2005? The board was, a step, was appointed. Uh, the working groups also were appointed, and they've been working on their tasks. The staff, approximately 18 people, have been hired. Uh, there was a statewide bidding for the headquarters, which meant many cities came up to help try to get the institute located in their town. And at the end of that, uh, San Francisco won the bid, um, and we moved into new quarters in November. The amazing thing is that each of the cities offered to provide free rent plus facilities for 10 years for the Institute. And I must say, at the NIH, I'm sure they were just, you know, struggling to see why NIH doesn't get such consideration. Um, and all this was done uh, in the public with a lot of media coverage. In fact, I might say too much media coverage because it makes life very difficult to get work done. So we've also done, uh, made some advances scientifically and administratively. Scientifically, we've launched the stem cell training program. We've re reviewed, put out an RFA, reviewed grants, and we've got 16 proposals, all approved, lined up, ready to go when the money comes in. We've also had the first stem cell conference to help us with our strategic planning. That was conducted in October 2005. We had, oh, international and national scientists come to tell us about cutting-edge research in stem cell um, biology in the field and to give us recommendations of how to move ahead. We've also adopted critical policies, and I'm very grateful for Ms. Knowles for pointing them out. These include grants review criteria, grants administration, intellectual property, standards and ethical guidelines, all conducted in pu public meetings with public participation. So as you know, uh, 
We have a grants administration policy on the docket ready for the ICOC to approve in our April meeting. The medical ethical standards regulations have gone through many reiterations and have been approved in our last meeting and the intellectual property policy for nonprofit organizations. We're now working on the same policy for for-profit organizations. And I'd be happy to answer questions about specifics in any of these policies. Finally, in 2006, uh, we hope to begin to establish the strategic plan. As you've heard uh, from the UK, that is not a trivial enterprise. We want to get a, a lot of feedback from all our constituents to see how best to move forward with a timeline. Uh, we're going to fund the training grant with what we hope is private monies coming in soon and uh, develop a unified web-based application and grant administration system and database. This infrastructure that you don't see when you get grants is what makes or breaks an institution. And we, as stewards of the public's money, have to devise systems that we can do uh, regular reporting to the public. And finally, we have to build up uh, institutional staff. We're really strapped for people. And although we have many things on high priority, we can't do them all at once. So I think with that, because we have a full program, I'm going to stop and I'll be happy to entertain questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arlene. Our next panelist is Ms. Judy Haley. Uh, Judith uh, Haley is president and co-founder of Texans Advancement of Medical Research, TAMR. TAMR was started in 2003 by a small group of health advocates in response to legislation introduced by the 78th uh, Texas legislature to ban somatic cell nuclear transfer, sometimes called therapeutic cloning. From 2003 to 2005, Ms. Haley served as vice president of TAMR till her appointment as president in June of 2005. She is also chair of the Texas Diabetes Council and was a key driver in promoting the passage of the first ever statewide diabetes school guidelines bills during the 79th, 79th legislature. Today, she gives a summary of the work of TAMR, what it has done over these past three years, promoting stem cell research, preventing restrictive legislating, legislation. Uh, please welcome Judy Haley. Thank you so much. I think I'm the first uh, homegrown speaker that we have, so I don't have nearly as interesting an accent as most of the others. But I'm going to describe for you my journey from soccer mom to super advocate or compulsive person, as my children call it. And I'm going to briefly tell you about some of the drama of the past, present, and future of stem cell advocacy in Texas from the perspective of a group which I helped co-found, Texans for Advancement of Medical Research, or TAMR. Welcome to my world of stem cell research. It seems like, at least to my family, that I live, sleep, and breathe stem cells, but the promi <clears throat> promise of stem cells is so great that it needs everyone's best efforts to keep it moving ahead. You may have seen the 60 Minutes segment uh, about a week ago yesterday. On it, Dr. Hans Kirstead, a leading researcher in stem cell therapy and spinal cord injury, made the statement, I have never in my career seen a biological tool as powerful as stem cells. It addresses every single human disease. Wow, that's big. My personal foray into the world of regenerative medicine began in 1990 when my 10-year-old daughter Meredith was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. I was stunned and my husband and I were equally stunned a few months later when my son Corbin was also diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And so began our journey to find a cure for this debilitating, devastating disease. I began advocates advocating in the U.S. Congress for diabetes research seven years, seven full years before human embryonic stem cell research human embryonic stem cells were even discovered by James Thompson. And I began trying to help impact this disease at state level through my appointment by Governor George Bush to the Texas Diabetes Council in 1997, still a year before human embryonic stem cells were even discovered. Because of my state connection, I began hearing about a Texas bill 
which would prohibit SCNT, somatic cell nuclear transfer. And waiting in the wings was another bill that would have banned all embryonic stem cell research. Knowing that this state has such potential to find cures, not just for diabetes, but for so many other devastating diseases, and knowing that in Texas we have the bricks and mortar, we have the researchers, we have the history of cutting edge treatment and science through such legends right here in Houston as Michael DeBakey, five Nobel laureates. Uh, we have stars that uh, Dr. Shine referred to early in this, in this uh, event. We have those stars. And so I had felt that it was incumbent that I see what could be done to stop the prohibitive legislation. I found other advocates from families with diabetes, Parkinson's, MS, spinal cord injuries, other terrible diseases whose hope really hinges on regenerative medicine and the discoveries to be made there. This ragtag group met for the very first time at the state capitol in 2003 to testify on HB 1175, the bill banning stem cell research which was sent to a committee for hearing. At that hearing, our group of passionate and determined volunteers really connected, and we decided to formalize our relationship, becoming TAMR, Texans for Advancement of Medical Research. And unwilling to let the research opponents hijack our mission, we taglined ourselves because it is so true, advocates for life. That year, 2003, everyone in the Texas House of representatives knew that a ban bill banning stem cell research was a done deal. But what they didn't count on, what they didn't expect was a growing group of passionate people who are now TAMR, who would be at the Capitol every single week throughout the session to support stem cell research and to oppose bills that would ban it. We wondered, why did this bill go to regulated industries? Why not the Public Health Committee? <laughs> Well, that was less than 5,499 on politics. Bills aren't necessarily sent to the logical committee. They are sent to committees where the result can best be predetermined. In this case, the committee whose chairman was also the author of the anti-stem cell research bill. The hearing on 1175 did not go well. The committee chair held an invitation-only educational session the night before and presented only oppositional education. The next day, this well-funded team, which travels from state to state opposing stem cell research bills, testified at the hearing, and they were testified as the expert panel. There was no invitation to the Texas Health Science Centers, to the Texas Nobel laureates, to Texas preeminent physicians, or any other Texas-based or, scientist or ethicist. In the end, the bill was voted out. But when the killer D's, and those of you in Texas know who I'm talking about there, took off for Oklahoma and broke the quorum, time ran out and the bill died. But that wasn't the end of it. When an 11th hour amendment to ban the research was attempted, a courageous team of legislators stepped up to the back mic to oppose it. They argued a ban should not be legislated on a subject about which so many of us know so little. That logic was very persuasive, and the pro-research team was victorious. Scores of Texas will never forget their representatives who protected the stem cell research that year, and that includes my representative, who is here with us, Representative Willie, uh, Woolley, and uh, Representative Wong. And uh, we are very, very grateful to you all for your support. So fast forward two years to 2005, the most recent legislative session here in Texas. Tamer had used the interim to educate legislators about what stem cell research is and what it is not. We began the 79th session by helping the Senate and House leaders organize the Educational Forum on Stem Cell Research, addressing all sides of the science and the ethics. The panel this time included the science community from most of Texas science uh, academic institutions, as well as ethicists, legal experts, advocates, economists, lots of legislators and their aides attended or listened from their offices, and they began to understand. Now, every session requires a mind-numbing amount of work. 
In the 79th session, there were hearings, meetings, educational briefings, polling, drafting of legislation, analyses, calls, letters, grassroots visits, high hopes, low points, and activities that kept on going and going and going. Bills came from everywhere. And the good news this session was pro-research bills, 12, anti-research bills, three. We were making progress. We had more friends now, but we also had more vocal opponents. Tamar was now front and center on everyone's radar screen, and even the soccer moms with sick children were sometimes called Darth Vader's on the opposition's website. So what happened in the 79th session? All forms of stem cell research are still legal in Texas. Once again, a major victory. None of the stem cell research bills, good or bad, passed out of committee that session in the House or the Senate. The threat of a gubernatorial veto caused the legislative team to shift its focus from, progressive, from aggressively promoting the 12 good bills to preventing passage of a research ban. What could the anti-research bills have done to Texans? They would have been disastrous. A teenager with MS a college student with diabetes, a mother trying to help cure her child, a Texas scientist looking for answers, a delivery truck driver taking cells to a laboratory, anyone who participates in research or treatment or transports products for or from SCNT would be guilty of a felony and a fine of not less than half a million dollars. Even Granny with Parkinson's would be guilty so we labeled this bill the Granny Goes to Jail Bill. <laughs> well, Granny is safe for now since the anti-research bills failed. But two things must happen to keep Granny safe here in Texas. First of all, the public and our elected officials must be educated on the science facts of stem cell research. But that isn't enough. The public and the science commit community, and that's everybody here in this room, must engage in legislative, the legislative process. We must send a clear and consistent message to our elected officials. All forms of stem cell research must move forward. We can't choose one over the other. It's going to take all of these forms of stem cell research to cure the terrible diseases that are facing us. Of course it should all move forward. The majority of Texans support all forms of stem cell research and polls like the Research America poll and the Lone Star polls prove this. Now we've told you what the general public and science community need to do to help and Tamar's goals work in concert. We want to help legislators pass bills that protect stem cell research and treatment in Texas and in the U.S based on the ethical guidelines set out, as you've heard, by the National Academies of Science. But just protecting a ban from a ban isn't enough because even the, the threat of a ban has a chilling effect that keeps research from really gearing up in Texas. We want, when the time is right, to help pass legislation to permit state funding for cutting edge research in regenerative medicine bolstering, and once again, you've heard this, both the health of Texans and of the state's economy. We want to help other states struggling with these restrictive bills. In fact, we just last week helped Mississippi to prevent a bill which was steamrollering through their legislature and has now been tabled and is no longer on the table this, this session. We want to cure the li those living now with terrible diseases like my two children but an even deeper impetus for this goal and for our dedication to them is to make sure that my grandbabies, and I have to take a little bit of grandmother's privilege here, my new grandbabies and your children and grandchildren are safe from a lifetime of suffering. Regenerative medicine in which stem cell research is key holds that potential and that promise. Tamar wants to do its part. We are, as Dr. Shine encouraged, reaching for the stars to protect research that may eradicate diseases and conditions from the face of the earth so that Parkinson's, diabetes, cancer, MS, and other such plagues will take their place in the medical history books alongside polio and smallpox. 
but Tamar can't do it alone. We need your help, and this is my call to action for you. We need advocates and scientists and physicians to make their needs and opinions clear. None of us wants to wake up some morning to the news that Texas has denied the science to that community and access to treatment to those with the diseases. And don't kid yourself, it can very well happen if we don't all get involved. I hope you will take a minute to fill out one of these forms that's out on the table that will just tell Tamara that you're willing to help. <coughs> Please become, along with us, in the truest sense of the words, advocates for life. And then we can truly echo Dr. Shine's goals. The stars bring light that's big and bright deep in the heart of Texas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. Well, we're honored today to have our third panelist, uh, Representative Beverly Woolley. Beverly Woolley is currently serving her sixth term, I think. I think that's right, in the Texas House of Representatives, District 136. Uh, presently, Representative Woolley is the chairman of the House, House Committee on Calendars and serves as a member on the House Committee on Civil Practices and the House Committee on Ways and Means. She's a native Houstonian, a graduate of the University of Houston. Representative Woolley has been an outstanding supporter of stem cell research in Austin and has sponsored legislation to enhance adult and embryonic stem cell research in the state. As someone who cares deeply about health and research, uh, I personally consider us most fortunate to have her representing us in the legislature. Please welcome Representative Beverly Woolley. Well, I think at this point it's uh, good afternoon. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Judy, you may have been the first homegrown, but I'm the second. I'm a native Houstonian also. And since I don't have a beautiful PowerPoint uh, presentation, may I just reuse yours? It would be just <laughs> all those beautiful pictures of the Capitol. Uh, I am honored to be here and to be uh, sitting on this distinguished uh, panel. I'd like to recognize my colleague, uh, Martha Wong, because she's been a major help and a major supporter of stem cell research, and I'm uh, really happy to see her today. And then I'm going to give a disclaimer. I am not a medical doctor. I am not a doctor of any sort. So my interest is strictly as a Houstonian, as a Texan, and as a legislator. Uh, I don't want to see Houston and Texas lose out to California, sorry, Arlene, <laughs> or to New Jersey or Ohio or the U UK or where else. It disturbs me and it concerns me that we are losing researchers and we are losing uh, medical professionals to these other states, to these other countries, so that they can go forward in the research that's so necessary to finding cures. Um, I'm really troubled by the stories of our graduate students who choose to study elsewhere. Uh, we have a long history uh, as Houstonians and, and as Texans uh, to, of being on the forefront of medical uh, research. Uh, we're proud to call Drs. DeBakey and, and Dr. Cooley Houstonians. We're proud of, of having so many Nobel Prize winners uh, in our city. Uh, and we're, we've got to maintain this. So that's, that's my interest. Uh, it's in seeing what can be done. But what you have to understand is this is a real threat. And these people are really sincere about the ethical and moral issues revolving around stem cell research. And the only way we're going to, to get through and we're going to be able to change the climate is through education, education, education. And you can't start as medical researchers who can use all these fancy terms and uh, all of uh, SCNT and, and expect people like me to understand. When um, how I got involved, Dr. James Willerson came to me and asked me to carry the bill uh, to provide funding for the uh, Heart Institute for a, an adult stem cell research center. That sounds, you know, noble cause. I'm willing to do that. Dr. Willerson's a wonderful person, and he's a friend of mine. I didn't know what I was getting into, quite frankly, or, or the issues that were involved. And I had to spend a great deal of time, energy, and efforts just trying to sort through as a layperson on what we were talking about. And uh, I see some familiar faces in this room that gave me a lot of help on that. I still don't understand. I, you know, I know the, the basics. I know what I think is right, and I know what I think is morally and ethically correct. But... 
a lot of legislators have, there are so many issues. We have five, thousands, 5,000, 6,000 bills that go through. We can't be experts on every one of these bills. We have to use the judgment of other people. And when you are, are um, firmly committed to the anti-abortion movement, and there are a great deal of those who feel that anything along those lines are morally uh, pro, uh, should be prohibited, you've got, you've got to deal with these issues, and you've got to convince people, and you've got to show them where they're wrong on stem cell research and, and what does not interfere with moral and ethical uh, values. Uh, so this is your task. I can't do it. I, I mean, I can do a certain amount, but my um, knowledge and information is limited. Judy does a great job. Ellen Arnold, who here, who's here, they're they're beating the uh, the, the uh, pavement every day in the Capitol, trying to talk to legislators. But it's got to be done in little little small increments with with a few at a time, and really get get down to the ABCs and the one plus one. I mean, you can't use medical terms uh, and expect them to be comprehending and even listening to what you're saying. Uh, Judy's shaking her head. She's been there. She knows. So is Ellen. <laughs> um, but uh, so this is this is the problem we face. Um, my bill, which was House Bill 1929, uh, would have protected medical research and it would have established an advisory committee to guide research policy in Texas. This is something that the anti group did not do at all. They did not, well, number one, try to ban. They didn't. Their original bill did not ban human cloning, and it did not set up a, a commission uh, for ethical gu uh, guidelines. I think they went back and changed that later. They also also changed from they were anti uh, embryonic stem cell research and they switched then over to anti uh, SCNT. So they didn't really understand what they were doing. Um, but uh, the advisory committee would have been comprised of the executive commissioner of health and human services, seven scientists with experience in biomedical research, two medical uh, ethicists, two persons with relevant legal background, and two persons who are members of our leaders of religious organizations. Now we had, you know, just bare bones starts on the on this sort of thing, uh, and. Uh, my bill did not pass, nor did uh, the bill uh, allowing uh, money, uh, state money to go into um, the uh, uh, health, uh, um, the uh, Heart Institute's uh, uh, to create a uh, research center. But sometimes the best you can hope for is to get to have nothing passed. We were successful in keeping an anti uh, t uh, em embryonic or any sort of, anti uh, uh, of um, uh, medical research d uh, done on um, uh, stem cells. So sometimes you consider that excess. So what it, did that do? It gives us two years grace period to have to start all over again in January. Hopefully it won't, well, we're probably going to go into special session in April, but uh, I don't think these issues, you know, someone will try to bring them up. My, the, the, the position I, I have that helps as chair of calendars is everything has to come through me if it's going to be a bill, uh, to put a bill on the House floor. Now that can, I cannot keep amendments from being added to other bills, and that's what we had to constantly be vigilant on uh, and constantly watch and constantly fight. <laughs> Martha shaking her head. Judy uh, shaking her head. They know um, how difficult this is because you know at midnight somebody can slip something into another bill, and um, so you're, you've got to constantly be on guard. But um, know that I am there and uh, I'm willing to work. There are a number of us who do that. I, I really believe that I had the votes to pass my bill on the floor if we could have gotten it out of committee. But uh, but once again, I say sometimes not doing anything uh, is better, uh, even though it seems uh, unlikely that that be the case. Um, we do have a lot of support, but once again, we're going through a primary election actually tomorrow, and uh, the dynamics could change. Uh, we could lose some members who are supportive of our, um, our cause uh, on stem cells, and we'll just see where the numbers come out and, and where we go for next session. So with that, I'm going to close. I believe uh, that we're going to answer questions in general, and I'll be happy to do that. But thank you so much for having me here. Thank you very much, Representative Woolley. Let me ask the panel to come up, including Lori, if you don't mind, and sit here, and we'll, we'll take uh, 10, 15 minutes for questions. Uh, if you sit behind the sign with your name on it, that'll help, but I think you should sit wherever you want to. <laughs> and again, I want to say how appreciative we are uh, that Representative Woolley joined us and Representative 
Martha Wong with us there. We appreciate everything you do. Uh, and there are a lot of people in this room, certainly, that have worked extremely hard to help you. And, uh, and we will recruit many more. So questions to the panel, any of our panelists, if you have a specific uh, person you want to direct it to, please say so. Otherwise, we'll just let people pick up uh, the ones they like. Questions? <laughs> yes, Bill. Yes, I'd like to ask Laura, but I really enjoyed the presentation on the policy development. But you talked about a policy uh, locally or maybe a federal policy. But recently, I uh, saw a uh, editorial on it international policy or sort of a, a policy nationwide, uh, worldwide, on stem cells and uh, based on a lot that's happened this year that might be advisable. But how would you think we would deal with that, such a broad-based policy, even at the national level, with individual states and individual uh, laws being quite separate and, uh, and how would you uh, envision any kind of uh, such commission with, with all the various kinds of laws that exist throughout the world? Well, I think, first of all, you're probably referring to the, um, the Hinkston Group, I think it's called, that they were an international group of um, researchers and, and ethicists who came together. And they actually, their statement um, is a, a very broadly defined statement for principles to go ahead with stem cell research. So it's not, it's not specific in terms of really real regulatory nitty-gritty, but it does sort of provide a platform of principles, international principles, definitely a positive step forward. And it's that kind of instrument that is easiest in a country as large and as pluralistic as we were talking about this morning as the U.S. to get started. And I think that's probably what the NAS is, is going to hope to do with their national layer of oversight that they're talking about. It's not really oversight as much as it is a body that's going to review the guidelines which is absolutely critical in this area because the science changes so fast that, and in fact, what we've discovered in a number of, of laws is that if you articulate particular biotechnological applications that you want to either outlaw or permit, they're outdated essentially by the time the law gets up and running because there's actually something else that's more relevant that comes along. So, um, so it's it's important for any kind of national. Um, layer that's going to be added to be very broadly framed. Probably describing the ceiling of behavior, that's a good place to do that. Practice guidelines, codes of ethics, professional self-regulation, um, as, as articulated, is the first thing that's going to be easiest to put as an umbrella over the, all the different state type initiatives. So, this Other questions? Stein. As somebody who watched closely uh, Representative Woolley's leadership in the last session, I want to thank you for the wonderful job that you did, particularly in the last minutes of the session when some of those amendments came up. My question has to do with the advisory committee that you proposed. Who would appoint it, and how, do, how would you avoid the problem? I mean, you can, we've seen examples of commissions and other committees that get hijacked depending on the point of view. How do you assure that at least it's reasonably balanced, if not supportive of uh, research? Well, and of course, that that's, uh, uh, would be a, a, the difficulty. Actually, um, I believe my bill would have allowed the, the governor uh, to appoint. But, um, you know, that's, that's another question. Like I said, we were trying to keep it just down to the basics and try to, to at least get somewhere. Um, but uh, those are questions that have to be answered. By the way, Dr. Stein was one of the ones that helped educate me a little bit and, and was willing to go in and talk to the governor's uh, staff, uh, his chief of staff, and, and uh, uh, try to work with them to show them where they were wrong uh, on the issue. But as you can see how difficult it is to do that. But you're, that's one thing we'll have to look at again and, and need to... Um, to do, but that's usually the way that you do it is to put it under the governor's office on the appointments. Any questions? Let me take back here and then I'll come to the front. Please. Representative Willie, I want to also thank you for all the wonderful work you've been doing. Um, this is kind of a generic question, and that is uh, from an advocacy point of view, should the emphasis be placed more on the legislator or the legislator's constituency? I know this is a generic type question, but uh, it's one that's plagued us at the camera very much. Uh, who should we put, be putting the emphasis on? Well, on the education, it's got to come from the medical community. But what I would suggest is getting together small groups 
of medical people from each district who can go and talk to their legislatures, make them get people who are constituents that know what they're talking about uh, in the medical center to make appointments with each legislator. That's how you get through. People, uh, legislators listen primarily to their own constituents. And if if uh, if a group of doctors can't uh, you know call my office and said they'd like to meet with me on a certain issue, I'm going to be there to meet with them, and uh, that's the way you do it. Uh, or through your um, not just uh, medical community, your your um, institutional, uh, uh, your your research institutions, your hospitals, uh, people from the community that. Uh, uh, Legislators have to be responsive too. <coughs> uh, I would say would be the best approach, but one-on-one uh, -on -one with your legislators, but with a group from their each community. Dr. Colley. Um This is for Arlene. The, the California initiative, as I understand, is based on funding. Um, is is there a provision there to prohibit reproductive cloning, whether it's private or funded by your? Absolutely. No reproductive cloning. I mean, that's part of the proposition. Although it is lengthy, it's very clearly stated. Yes. So wherever the funding comes from? Um, it's, the proposition will, as our regs get developed, will become, will have the effect of law. So we hope that through that, through the standards, that when they become adopted as regulations in the state, it will have the effect of law. It would apply to the private sector? I believe so. Yeah. Questions? Yes, Irma. Dr. G. Lee. In, in California, uh, there are all these lawsuits pending. Uh, on one hand. On the other hand, your office is establishing an extremely well-organized process on how to deal with applications and so on. Uh, the timetable of these two things seems to be far apart. How are you going to proceed to get all these lawsuits in a fast train that this is not something that is going to take five years, six years to get sorted out? Very good question. Uh, as you may know, uh, lawsuits started last year, and one of them was thrown out of court. It was uh, filed on behalf of a fictitious embryo, so that was thrown out. The other uh, three plaintiffs uh, in two lawsuits have uh, been consolidated, and the trial just finished last Thursday. So we're waiting now for the judge to come up with her judgment. Uh, nevertheless, both sides have said that uh, it's going to be appealed, whatever the, con the result. Uh, and so we anticipate about a year uh, worth of time being down the drain because of this lawsuit. It's the, the lawsuits are filed by anti-abortion, anti-embryonic stem cell groups, very well-established groups, uh, one of them nationally. It was only formed the day before the lawsuit was filed, one of them. Uh, nevertheless, they did not file it because of the stem cell research. They filed it uh, on the grounds that the state agency that we are is not really a state agency and challenged us uh, for the authority to disperse um, federal, I mean state funds. So we are demonstrating to them our process uh, and, and our, uh, how we go by state regulation. Uh, and so we hope that the judge will see that that, that is not true and will th throw that out as well. Nevertheless, it will hold us up for, two, for 12 months. But I should say at this point, it stops us from issuing bonds on the New York Stock Exchange, state bonds. But we have continued to try to get what we call bond anticipation notes signed. These are from private philanthropic foundations or individuals who will buy these bands, bond anticipation notes, from which we will fund our first round of grants. Uh, when the bonds come through, they will exchange the notes for true bonds with the understanding that should that not occur, knock on wood, then uh, they have given a very generous grant to the state of California and to California researchers. <laughs> yes, please. I think everyone would agree that we live in a, a, a very polarized political environment today, but it appears to me that many of these same exact moral and ethical issues were addressed, say, 15, 20 years ago, 
uh, with IVF legislation. So I just ask the panel in general, uh, even though the climate is different than then, were there, are there lessons to be learned? Uh, and, and, and can we follow any guidelines from our experience there to get effective legislation for stem cells as we have today for uh, IVF clinics? Because after all, that legislation did result in the destroying of embryos and the same exact moral and ethical issues are on the table here. I'd just like to say I think that's why the group that had the bill, they first started in Texas with it being against embryonic stem cell re, uh, research, and when it was pointed out to them, then they would have to be against IVF, they switched over to them being against the SCNT instead. So, uh, yes, because they realized they were going they were fighting a losing battle on that, that issue. Uh, but um, one of the stumbling blocks is in the definition of embryo. <coughs> And uh, uh, I think that's something that the medical community has to, to um, better explain to people just, just what's meant by an embryo. Um, and, uh, but that was, they switched over because of that, that um, point. They thought they were fighting a losing battle on that issue. Anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, I also think that if you look at the regulation of new biotechnologies across history, you'll see that there is, it is the, a natural progression for, for there to be, um, choose my words carefully here, um, a sense of, of um, anxiety is not exactly what I want to say, because that sort of imp, imp, you know, implies it's irrational. It's not, but a sense of concern about new technologies as they're introduced. And then as we understand that they're going to be surrounded by certain limits, particularly we're talking about embryos here, they're going to be surrounded by limits that give some sort of weight to the fact that you're not talking about an enterprise with no moral cost, but you're talking about an enterprise where you're weighing moral costs in society, then you have a um, a, a society slowly recognizing that there are some things that should go ahead and they get more comfortable with it. And we've seen that from internationally, you see this from, you know, from um, uh, donor insemination, which was considered, you know, immoral at the beginning of, if it, of its introduction, right through IVF, which the Pope's, Pope spoke out against, through, you know, through the whole spectrum of things. And there are certain things like reproductive cloning that are likely going to remain off the page for all time. I mean, we say all time, but, you know. Um, and that's part of what troubles people. What's always going, is it always going to be a slippery slope? Um, and are, are there things that we feel we can actually put gates around and allow legitimate, legitimate research to take place inside those sort of bounds? So I think we can anticipate that the discussion will continue and that there will be <coughs> increased support. It would be unusual for there to be a decrease in support if you look historically through uh, the embryo research discussions internationally. One thing that's been, a, uh, I know will be a big stumbling block, is on um, the allowing of um, uh, commercialization of, of uh, don uh, donor eggs. or um, And that is a, I mean, that's one thing major that, they, uh, that anyone that's against it talks about is um, the commercial sale. And I, I think that's something we would have to be very, very careful about. As a follow-up okay. to that point, uh, Shouldn't the rejoinder always be when there's a concern about women putting eggs up for sale, or what have you, uh, that in fact SCNT itself would be a source of eggs and would be unlimited and in fact would guarantee that uh, uh, women wouldn't have to uh, be pursued because the, the eggs could in fact come from the SCNT procedure. Uh, is that not, is SCNT so much further down the road that you don't mention something like that? Because if stem cells give rise to every organ in the body, well, they, every tissue in the body, they can certainly give rise to eggs. I think that is a slippery slope, and that is that it's not clearly demonstrated, as far as I know, how well stem cells can create gametes, although there are a couple of reports possibly. But I think that, again, will join a new arena where use of stem cells to cre create gametes will be strongly scrutinized and frowned upon, I would say. So no, that that is, a, oh, please. So, yeah, please. No, I was just going to say that is becoming an international norm in this area. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, not to create them, not to create gambling for instance. Yeah. That uh, question, though, I mean, raises, and in my mind, something I'm very personally concerned about, mm -hmm. the, the rate at which science is advancing, medical science in particular, uh, the emerging fields at the interface of the physical sciences, biological sciences, I mean, very fast, society is going to be presented with the possibility of interventions in nature in various ways that, uh, that, I, that I think is very difficult for us to even imagine right now. And so the scientists need to be very, very clear that they understand that, that, that all of these matters involve very real ethical uh, concerns and that, that people who are genuinely uh, worried about the direction this is all going uh, uh, voice it must be heard and that it's not just science is going to do its thing whatever anybody thinks we've really got to work very very hard to avoid what I think is still a kind of a public perception and that makes the life of our legislatures and our members of Congress and our presidents and whatever just extremely difficult that's a real problem for the science community because there's a tendency for some of us to say well that's whatever we're talking about that's anti-science and the only way to get at that is just you know, treat it as a as a battle between us and them and nobody's going to win in that approach there are lots of issues that have been mentioned earlier today about that Ken mentioned several issues on the plate so we as scientists have a responsibility to here, here to get much better informed about ethical matters, much better informed about public opinion, religious views, everything else the public cares about, and then become more effective at articulating what the science is really all about and what these ethical trade-offs are really all about. And we can't do that alone. We'll have to do that in cooperation with people who... Uh, who understand these matters perhaps better than we do. Uh, last question, because I eat up too much of our lunch time and my own commentary, please. Um, this is for Representative Roy again. Thank you, Representative, for everything done, and also for uh, Representative Trump. Um In the uh, coming uh, session uh, and in the past session, we We've attempted to um, introduce legislation that not only protects the research search, but also addresses the issue of reproductive uh, cloning, that is, any attempt to create a human being. And um, I would just like to hear uh, from you about whether you think that always needs to be part of any bill going forward, that there be that ban in place. Um, yes. In fact, we were talking at the break that maybe uh, instead of doing trying to do one bill that allows every you know the, the stem cell research, that maybe we should approach it from just doing a bill that banned human cloning and uh, set up this uh, ethical uh, commission. Uh, there, period. Get that out of the way, and then go from there. Uh, the danger is is any bill that hits the floor. Uh, it's key, it's keeping it clean, uh, and and uh, uh, so. Um, I'm going to try to work on that and see if there's not some agreement we can come up with the, two, the other side to keep at least that part clean so we can at least have that much done and, and uh, calm some people's um, ultimate fear. Thank you. Well, I think our Chateaubriand, our lobster, is outside. <laughs> and so I want to thank all our speakers this morning and now in particular our wonderful panel for their presentation.